Maria Paula Ballesteros. She's originally from, from Colombia, from, from Bogota specifically. Um, and she spent uh, 10 years um, in program management and, and she has ten, uh, lots of field experience. She has worked with international and, and national organizations in conflict contexts in Colombia with a focus on education, health, prevention of child soldier recruitment and early childhood work. Her portfolio includes work at the Colombia National Planning Department, which oversees the country's social development progress. Maria Paula holds a double master's degree in development and governance from the Institute of Social Studies in The Hague and uh, international relations from the Barcelona Institute of International Studies. She joined PLAN two years ago as a PLAN Canada, I assume, um, as a program manager for the uh, pr pr Protecting the Rights of Conflict-Affected and Vulnerable Children in Colombia program. It's great to uh, be here and present to you um, Planning for the Future, Protecting the Rights of Conflict-Affected and Vulnerable Children in Colombia. This is a, plans, um, a project implemented by PLAN um, in Colombia during the last five years. We started in 2010 and we finished um, in 2015. Actually, we finished implementation of activities a month ago. So, so it has been implemented for five years. This is just um, the outline that we're going to, uh, I'm just going to mention briefly. So we're going to see a general background information, um, context, uh, the theory underlying the project, project objectives, uh, project results, a little life story, Ismael, um, about Ismael, and then the conclusion. Planning for the future, protecting the rights of conflict affected and vulnerable children in Colombia. It's an um, integrated approach to conflict, vulnerability, and protection. Uh, it is an integrated child protection project. Its, um, its main purpose is to fully realize the children, uh, the rights of children in Tumaco and Cartagena, the, the locations where it was implemented, by strengthening institutional, community, children, and youth capacities to improve the protection of and ability to exercise their rights. As you can see, we work with the different actors involved in child protection, and, and, um, and that's, that's the, uh, the core of the project. Uh, it is a DFAD project, Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development. Um, Five-year project, as I already mentioned. Uh, it was implemented in Tumaco and Cartagena. I am going to focus my presentation on Tumaco because it's uh, an active conflict zone in Colombia and it's just more pertinent for this uh, discussion. Um, the project reached 200,000 direct beneficiaries in rural and urban areas um, and 350,000 indirect beneficiaries in rural and urban areas as well. So Colombia, just to give you uh, context, Colombia, despite being a middle income country, it has the third highest level of inequality in Latin America. Um, in addition, and, and that is part of the reason why the reality that you see in Bogota, the capital, is so different to what you see in a place like Tumaco. It's completely, completely different realities. Uh, in addition, for more than five decades, um, it has uh, been affected by, conflict, by armed conflict fueled by drug trafficking. Uh, this has devastated Colombia's population and its coping and protection mechanisms. All this situation has led to vulnerability, poverty, uh, well, among other different issues. I'm going to, uh, it's very important to just see the geography of the country because it helps understand why, I mean, it helps understand poverty. It helps under, understand unequal access to um, basic services. And, and it just gives us an idea of, of why are things how they are in the country. Um, so as you can see, the, um, well, Colombia, this is Los, Los Andes mountain range that starts in Colombia and then it just goes through South America. As you can see, it divides the country in two. Um, it's very difficult. And just to give you an example of the effect of mountains in Colombia, and just how difficult it is to access different parts in the country, um, to fly from Bogota to Tumaco takes you one hour. To drive from Bogota to Tumaco takes you 23 hours. So that would just give you an idea of how difficult it is to reach all these remote places. Um, what you see here in green, like this area, these are, these are the main mountains, but these are mountains as well, and rainforest. So it is not a surprise to see and to understand that um, these are the locations for coca crops and for cocaine laboratories. That makes Tumaco the perfect as access or the perfect strategic location for, drug, for smuggling drugs and guns. 
And that is also part of the reason why illegal armed groups in the country, by illegal armed groups I mean uh, paramilitaries, uh, guerrilla groups, which, is, which would be FARC and ELN, uh, they fight constantly over the control of the territory. And when they are like struggling around it, because they, I mean, their main source of income is drug trafficking. So like the reason why they fight about, like in the process of just fighting over the control of the territory, that they, they displace uh, the population. So that's why most of the people who have been displaced, they come from this region and they get to the Pacific, or they come from like from the Pacific uh, coast. So that is also part, I mean, that's, that's the perfect, Tumaco becomes a perfect storm for conflict and displacement and poverty. Also just, it is important to have in mind how difficult it is um, for Tumaco, uh, like the access, right, for Tumaco. Colombia was for many years, it was a centralized country and it only decentralized until 1990s. So just imagine how difficult it was for a place like Tumaco to get like the aqueduct going. Today, there's no aqueduct. <laughs> like we're working on the rehabilitation of the aqueduct. Just to give you an example of how difficult and how access becomes a problem in terms of basic services. So these are just two pictures that give you, can give you an idea of how Tumaco looks like. Um, based on this reality, PLAN um, implemented the project based on PLAN's signature approach, which is Child Centered Community Development, CCCD. So CCCD is a child rights um, approach, rights-based approach, and what PLAN does is that it enhances the capacity of the different actors um, that are involved in the process, like in child protection, so communities, youth, families, um, children, all the different actors. And what happens is that they become all this training and all this capacity enhancing in order to make them um, agents of their own development. Um, and then they're able to address structural causes of um, poverty and violence. And, and th that is the main purpose. So the five standards for uh, CCCD would be first working with children and communities tackling exclusion and gender equality, engaging civil society, influencing government, strengthening plans accountability. Um, and then that will lead us, I mean, the main purpose, right, of CCCD is for children to fully realize their rights. And then, um, as you can see, those rights can be divided in four uh, categories. This right, the fundamental rights that have been included in the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. So they can be divided in, fra in four broad categories. So right to protection, right to survival, right to development and right to participation. All these are addressed by the project. In order to do that, um, or just addressing that first uh, old CCCD as the underlying theory for the project, the main purpose of the project was for girls and boys of all ages in Tumaco and Cartagena uh, to be more able to access, exercise, and enjoy their rights to survival, protection, the rights we saw before. Um, in order to do that, we had to work with different actors, and, and that involved different challenges, depending on the actors. So the first group of actors we worked with were duty bearers. The main purpose with them was to improve quality and thematic coverage of policies and programs uh, related to uh, child rights. Um, in order to do that, we had several challenges that we had to overcome. And the first one, that are, that are characteristic of a location like Tumaco and are characteristic of a vulnerable place like Tumaco. So the first one is uh, low capacity and poor governance. Um, most of the locations with the characteristics of Tumaco, they have um, uh, illegal armed groups have been, have been um, influencing politics and institutions for several years. Um, not now, but just like it was like that for several years, 20, 20 25 years. So the direct consequence of that is that people stop participating. People stop trusting the government. People stopped um, just being, there was a complete disconnection between institutions and communities. And the direct influence of that, or the direct, the direct uh, consequence of that, was that um, there was no accountability. People stopped holding their governments accountable and politicians got used to just not being accountable to anybody. Uh, so that, that, is, that is a big problem, like that contributes to low capacity. In addition, every time there's a new mayor, and this is in Colombia, this is just in general in Colombia, every time there's a new mayor, or I mean, a new mayor is elected, um, there's complete staff turnover. So like the people who used to be there are not there anymore in the mayor's office. The consequence of that, the direct consequence of that, is that um, 
there's lack of continuity in policies and there's lack of continuity in investment. And that's huge for poor governance because then there's no continuity at all in the institutions. You don't have the same staff. It's very difficult for you to continue working. So those, those are the, like the major challenges we face with duty bearers, civil society, uh, civil servants and institutions. And then the second group we worked with were the communities. Uh, especially we worked with civil society organizations and women's organizations. Uh, the main purpose with them was to increase capacity to influence government decision making on child rights. In order to do that, we had to overcome several challenges as well. So as, you, as we discussed before, the problem was that uh, many like people and communities, they don't trust their government. But in addition, um, most of the population we worked with in, in Colombia, they are victims. And not only victims, victims of conflict, but they have been uh, displaced, so they're internal displaced population. And just to give you some, like an additional characteristic of the population we were working with, they had been individually displaced, which is, there is a big difference between individual displacement and, and um, mass displacement. Because when you, as an individual person who has been displaced, um, when, you, when you arrive to a new place, you don't only left, you didn't only leave behind uh, your, your house, your assets, and your life. You left behind, you left behind your community, and you left behind the, cap the capacity or the ability to trust others. So when you arrive to a new place, like you don't trust your neighbor. You don't trust, you don't know if he or she or his family may be involved with a group that displaced you in the first place. And that gives you, you can't trust that person. You can't trust the community. You can't trust, it's very difficult for you to trust um, the, the territory and the institutions. So it's very difficult to establish bonds with the territory and to establish bonds um, with the community around you. And that becomes a huge challenge when you're working with community and when you want them to influence government because they don't trust their government in the first place. They don't trust each other in the first place. And then gender. This is not. Um, this was a cross-cutting topic in the project, and the main purpose of of the of the um, of this of gender it was just to or the main the challenge. Let's start with the challenge that we faced was that Tumaco is a male-dominated culture. Many cities on the coast they are male-dominated culture. I mean, it's just a characteristic of the population, and um, it's so it is very difficult to approach gender with 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 municipality or a town with these characteristics. So that was, that was a, like a big challenge. And gender was a cross-cutting topper. So it was like working with every single group. And then rights holders. They were uh, children and youth. We were working with them to increase their abil ability to, um, for them to exercise their rights to participation, inclusion, identity, and citizenship. Um, as I mentioned before, they, they grew up seeing their parents not trusting the government, not trusting institutions, not trusting the neighbor, not trusting the community. So they grew up uh, with, the, with that um, mindset. And then in addition, there's something that I would really like to highlight here, and it's that um, given the, the situation in Tumaco, it is illegal um, economic options are normal like drug trafficking or crime organizations or, uh, yeah, you name it, delinquency in general, because there, there are lack of economic opportunities in the municipalities like this. So um, like the, the, the major challenge here was to work with them um, and overcome that idea. I mean, they don't see their lives outside of poverty cycle. They don't see their lives outside of illegal cycles. They're just, it's normal. Like, their neighbor was involved in, in I don't know, I don't know, name it, drug trafficking or just whatever. And it's very difficult for, see, for them to see their lives outside of those um, illegal, po illegal or poverty cycles. And the fourth one was just access to basic services. And, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and to improve the quality and the access to these basic services. In order to do that, we work with duty bearers, with institutions and civil uh, servants um, to improve their services. And we work with different agencies. Um, we work with uh, health, uh, sexual and reproductive health, um, education, uh, water and sanitation, different, different institutions. And then that was the main purpose. The, the most difficult challenge there was just poor infrastructure, and then access to, to those services. And then project results. <clears throat> and this is my favorite part. Um, 
So the first one, it with duty varies. This is a capacity building project. So as a consequence, civil servants develop skills, design tools, but I would like to highlight their change in the mindset because for me, that was the biggest achievement. And the direct, uh, let's say, implication or the direct consequence of uh, changing the mindset was that they developed action plans to improve the delivery of services of their institutions. So I'll give you an example that gives us just, just how that change in the mindset changed the delivery of services as well. Um, we worked with an institution that provides services to uh, displaced population. And then for the very first time, civil servants were thinking from the perspective of the community. And they realized that most of the people who are displaced didn't know how to read and write. So if you arrive to an institution that is supposed to provide you services, you don't know how to read and write, you don't trust your neighbor, and you feel humiliated just to ask for, you know, like, what, what, where do I have to sign? What do I have to do? And they decide to stop going to these institutions in the first place. So when civil servants <clears throat> realized that, they decided to consult with plan support and just like all this process was assisted by plan. They decided to go and consult a group of IDPs in their, in their municipality, in their town, and, um, and ask them, okay, what do you need? How can we help? How can we improve this process? And they said, well, a video. A video would just make it easier for everyone. So with plan support, uh, a video was designed just showing what are the steps that need to be followed, um, where do they have to sign, what are the processes they have to go through in order to access different services. So that was a huge achievement. The second, the second one uh, was uh, with community CSOs and women's organizations. Was um, it was we didn't they first they overcame um, distrust, which was the main challenge that we had, but. In addition to that, they established organizations. They established um, alliances between within the community and with institutions, which was huge um, for them. They um, understood and they were studying the needs of the, of the town, and they designed three public policies. And then they went to the, um, this is like along the five years. They went and speak uh, to talk with the, uh, with the mayor and the mayor's office. And uh, the mayor <laughs> accepted or approved these three public policies, incorporated them as part of the municipal development plan, and implemented it with his own budget. This was a huge achievement, not only for the women who were part of this process, but for the town. I mean, it, it is an historic event that, like, for the first time, these institutions are listening to their communities and are implementing policies that come from the community in the first place. So just, just that, and just like recovering trust and what that means in terms of social bonds with their institutions and their governments. And the third one, or not the third one, but just like in terms of gender, I would like to highlight, um, we, we uh, the project implemented a new masculinity strategy. So uh, it was working with different men on the creation of a new generation of men. And the project started working with them, worked with 50, at the beginning, only five people, literally five people assisted to the trainings, like five men assisted to the trainings. Like at the very end, 50 men were assisting to the training, which was huge. And for the first time they were, they realized how, well, if I help my wife, if I take care of my children, if I help in the kitchen, that doesn't make me less of a man. Um, and therefore I can change, and it's in my hands, like to change the like gender and just to, um, and to transform gender violence. So that, that was a big achievement as well. And then rights holders. Mm, with them, with youth, there was a very similar process. Um, they designed their own youth public policy. They went and discussed that with the mayor and, and the mayor approved it. But more than that, I would like to uh, highlight the achievement in terms of income generation projects. So the project, um, I mean like planning for the future and plan supported, um, assisted technically and uh, financially assisted uh, income, gen well business uh, plans from this youth. You just can't imagine how engaged these youth were, how thorough they were with their, with their businesses, and, um, and how successful they were with them. Like most, well, not most of them actually, I have to say that all of them um, were successful and are still active, which is very difficult for an income generation project. Normally after a year, uh, I mean, surviving the first year is very difficult. And then like most of them were, are, have been active for more than two years, which is, which is a huge achievement. But more than that, I would like to highlight how all these youth started thinking their lives 
like outside of the poverty cycle, outside of the illegal um, cycles that drug trafficking or crime involves. And, and that was huge. I mean, because they were starting not, not only to think their future outside of them, but just like their community, because they were, there's one business, and I, if I have time, I'll mention it. Um, uh, one youth who, who started working with other youth in the, his community just to just do it, which was huge. And then fourth, like the access to basic services. Um, we worked with, with, I will highlight what we, the achievements um, in terms of education and flexible me methodologies. We worked with 60 schools, which are all schools in Tumaco. And what we did with them, it was working with uh, teachers just to, because they were very hesitant. They, they didn't want to implement uh, flexible methodologies because it was new for them and they didn't trust that methodology. But they realized how important it is for IDPs, for children who have been displaced, to be, to be re-enrolled with flexible methodologies. And not only to be re-enrolled, but just to, normally they're re-enrolled and they drop out um, like some months after because they, it's very difficult for them to keep up with the rhythm of the other children. Flexible methodologies just helps them to overcome that stage. Um, so well, today 60, uh, 60 schools are uh, implementing flexible methodologies in Tumaco, which is a, a big achievement as well. And then, well, the conclusion. As a conclusion, I would like to highlight what did the project do. So the project minimized the impact of conflict and poverty uh, and address vulnerability causes such as the ones we mentioned. Weak social fabric, low participation in institutional distrust, uh, poor governance and low capacity, weak institutional linkages, male-dominated culture, limited income generation opportunities, unclear future for children and youth, uh, marginalization and unequal access to social services. And the way the project worked with all this or just addressed all these causes was with uh, maximizing synergies around protection and increasing stakeholder potential, which increased capacity and opportunity. And like the way we did that, it was just what I was trying to explain, which was duty bearers, we strengthened institution and institutional linkages to guarantee children's rights, um, which improved access to services. Uh, with other responsible actors, with the communities, we strengthened social fabric participation and inclusion, and then it was just, the fact that they realize that they need others to succeed. That if I trust my neighbors, it's easier for both of us to go to the mayor and talk and just like go, I don't know, through an advocacy process or um, and it's easier if I'm with my neighbor and with my community than if I go by myself. And that was huge. Uh, with rights holders, empowerment of children and youth, income generation opportunities, the change in mindset, as I had mentioned before. Uh, regarding hope for the future outside of illicit or poverty cycles, and then the creation of protective environments, which was which which improved. So, yeah, and I don't know if I have time to go. Uh, maybe I'm just. Sure. Is it a couple minutes? Yeah. Oh, well, I can. I can be. I can, it can be short. So this is the life story of Ismail. Ismail is in the center, and <laughs> Ismail is in the center, and. Um, he has, I would say, it is the typical life of a person in Tumaco. So his family and his friends were, um, well, were killed by the conflict. Um, so he was, he's living by himself with his, I think it's his mother. Um, and then he finished school, which is a huge achievement. Only 58% of uh, children finish elementary school in Tumaco. So you just can't imagine. He finished high school which was huge. Um, and then he, Plan was working with his community with theater, theater for the oppressed. I don't know if you have heard this methodology. So that's what was being implemented. And he really liked it. And he thought that he could create, and he liked the methodology, he liked theater, and he thought that he could create his own group of theater. And then all the youth that are sitting next to him are part of a the theater group. And I don't know if you can see it here, just like this is their logo and they're called Masters of Entertainment. Um, and then they started, Plan started training them on theater, and, and he liked it. He established his own group, and for example, today he's, he has been hired by the, his group has been hired by the mayor's office to help with sensibilization of communities. So this is what I mean that income generation became something real for him, doing what he wants, working with communities, and just working with youth at the same time. Completely, I mean, he understands what legal economy means now, 
uh, and how he can work with others uh, legally. Now, he has a perfect profile of a leader. A person like him could be the leader he is with the, co the communities, or he could be the leader of a guerrilla group, or he could be just leading drug trafficking in the region. Uh, so, like every child who is born in Tumaco, they have those two options. They can be, uh, they can go um, and lead, I don't know, like drug trafficking groups, or they can become leaders like him. It's more difficult and takes more time, but he believed, he believed in himself, which I think was the biggest achievement. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Maria Paula. Um, uh, as we get Mukti set up, I don't know if there are any questions that are top of mind right now for folks uh, as we set up uh, Mukti's presentation. Oh. Um, I guess I want you to speak. That's okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, yeah, I had a question. You, you obviously achieved a huge amount there. Um, I'm interested in the characteristics of a team on the ground. Uh, the characteristics of a team on the ground who helped affect all of this, both in terms of how many people you had and uh, what the roles of those people were. Plan has, uh, oh, wait. <laughs> Plan has an office in Tumaco, so it has a country. I mean, it's it's um, a unit. Uh, it has a like it's a whole office there, and people involved in the project, uh, 12, 13 people working with different communities. Um, like only in Tumaco, we reached 70,000 youth, which is, uh, chil I mean, children, adolescents, and youth, uh, which is huge. Um, so yeah, like it, it, we needed a big team. They were completely committed. That is something that it is heartwarming to see how committed they are. It is just incredible, like how, I mean, w I mean we're talking about an active conflict zone. Like I was there a month ago. And there were two bombs that they I was leaving, and there was a threat to bomb the road to the airport. So like I didn't even know if I was able to to leave or not. Um, and this is their daily life. So so they're completely committed. They're I think that's something important that I would like to highlight, and it's part of the, in my opinion, it's part of the success of the project. And is that most of the people are from Tumaco and have been working in Tumaco for more than 40 years. So community and even guerrilla groups trust them. Um, so this is, I mean, and, and even the mayor, for example, the mayor had been, when he was growing up, he was a sponsored child by plan. So that is part of the reason why he was so close and just like he was willing to listen to youth and listen to children. So, so that, that's a key characteristic of the team. Mukti has been a peace practitioner, educator, facilitator, and consultant for over 12 years. He's lived and worked in South Asia and has developed and implemented uh, multiple peace projects and programs. He has supervised peace training for the South Asian emerging leaders and is a founding member of Peace Initiative Network Nepal, uh, associated with more than 397 NGOs, um, which has been instrumental in establishing the foundation for peace in that country. Mukti is active in teaching peace and has delivered lectures at various universities in uh, Europe and Asia. He's a visiting research fellow at the Center for Religions for Reconciliation and Peace at the University of Winchester. And as a, as a peace practitioner, Mukti also brings extensive experience from the field. He's worked in both supporting conflict affected and displaced people, and later in rehabilitation and reconciliation. He also facilitates policy on inter internally displaced uh, people affected by conflict. Uh, and he is an expert mentor. Mukti has facilitated several trainings focused on peace building, reconciliation, and conflict uh, transformation. He brings hands-on experience um, with peace building programs from South and Southeast Asia uh, and Rwanda. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, as I was preparing this presentation, 7.9 magnitude earthquake hit Nepal. Actually, I belong to Nepal origin, so. I was thinking I would present a lot more Sri Lankan context and Cambodian and Rwandan context. I decided not to, but I might ch you know, jump in and put some case studies from them. But my presentation totally rely on Nepal for the honor of those who lost their life in earthquake, uh, remembering all those who have suffered from this earthquake. And I pray along with you for the Nepal and Nepalese. So my presentation basically is my personal experiences uh, in conflict prevention and transformation. 
Uh, it's totally operational case studies and how I, you know, got involved in and how I learned this conflict prevention, and, uh, mostly a multidimensional approach and integrating conflict um, pre prevention approaches into program development uh, and pr conflict transformation. The context of conflict is changing from Cold War era. Well, it, it has become more increasingly, you know, complex and it's more local, and it's more multi-dimensional. Earlier, it used to be a national conflict, or you know, I, I won't really go deep into the post-colonial, well, during colonial state, or now the security risks has become more you know, powerful to warring social groups operating in the fragile states. So the shift, there's a shift from the powerful, warring, powerful countries to within country, like it's more an intra, it's not intra-state, it's more within interstate. The conflict in Nepal, the conflict just we heard from Colombia. So the conflict prevention itself is not very new context. It, it began in 1990s, but mostly the practice couldn't, like practice didn't really had an positive outcome during all those eras. There, there was this practice, conflict prevention practice, but it didn't really succeed in achieving conflict prevention or conflict transformation. So there was a shift from the conflict prevention, the integrated conflict prevention uh, from old approach to new integrated approach. So a case from Nepal. How many of you had heard about the conflict in Nepal? Very few. Oh, almost all, yeah. Okay. So I don't think so. I'll have to go deep into the conflict in Nepal. Well, as Maria said, during conflict, everything gets disfragmented. The system, there is no system. I was living there for almost eight years uh, in the conflict. Uh, well, I was sharing the story how I was captivated for six hours by the Maoist and almost taken to their, you know, code or their kind of jungles in area where they were camping. But with, with my negotiation skills, I was able to really have a dialogue with them. So it's, there's no system at all. Even though in those situations, you really have to reach people's, uh, the well, mostly the vulnerable peoples living in rural areas. Well, the conflict is between government and Maoist, uh, the rebel, what they call rebel parties, you know, rebellions. Uh, well, they started the conflict in 1996 and lasted for 10 years. Well, basically, they were demanding 40 points uh, that they want the country reforms and the constitution be drafted. But the then prime ministers or the govern government, they, they really didn't consider their points. And then these dissatisfied groups went to jungle and started a civil movement. Nepal being a very poor country with less GDP uh, and poor, like poor, there are poorer of poor. 20% of poor are really poor and f around 40% of people are poor. Maoists really got these people got involved in their moment because pe it was very easy for Maoists to hire them, no jobs, no government, no government presence, no securities, poor poverty. These were all the factors that really motivated youth to go into Maoist armies and fight for them. And they were they were promising that they will pay them high amount of money or good salaries in terms of um, money for these unemployed youth. I won't go into details about all this country context. Whereas, I want to highlight, I want to take you into one community during those situations. The community is very fragile. There's almost 500 house, and almost 200 were meet like from hill people. I hope you, you would basically understand the context because 
in Nepal, there's a caste-based system which really is a hindrance in development. Like, and you are segregated based on your caste, and the discrimination is much more higher if people belong to the lower caste from the upper caste. Well, similar in hill people and Madesi people. The hill people are origin from the hill regions, and the Madesis are mostly the Indian origins. They are in the southern part of Nepal. They were living together, but still in a very fragile condition. No trust between those two groups. Living together still. Very, but they were very culturally oriented. And children and women were, even men feel very vulnerable to violence. It might erupt, like violence might erupt any, any time. We were aware about that. But nothing has happened. Like no, Nobody came in to prevent the conflict there. That is the right time as an international development organization to enter into the community or the country to prevent the conflict. That's the real investment to make. But nobody entered into the community. And what happened to our case? Oh, how, how does this state view uh, for this conflict? As we knew, I tried to lobby with several donors. Donors were not interested to fund the project because that's a long-term project. We want immediate result from the project. And then I was kind of quiet. And how state sees this situation? Well, state wanted to take an advantage of this kind of situ fragile situation. See, well, state doesn't really know it was unclear when this violence will erupt or the or violence will really erupt or no. So state national interest is different in handling the diff national conflict rather than the community conflict. So state interest was very different. And government was not merely interested in investing high amount of money in, in just pre in preventive measures. So even pre preventive measures cost high amount of money. So what happened to our case? As expected, conflict erupted. 35 people died. 200 houses were burned down. They were displaced. So, so hill origin people were displaced from the place where they were living. They came to a jungle. Children and women were were more were vulnerable. They were mostly affected by that violence. Well, rape was all even reported. So lived in jungle for three months. But still, these hill people wanted to go back in the community and live in this community together with their interests were there. That they were born there. They want to go back and live in the communities. So what happened after this? Earlier, nobody were interested to you know, prevent this conflict. As I was longing and asking donors to give funds for preventing this conflict. But now, massive donations came into to support these hill people. There were shelter clusters. There were children's clusters coming in. You know. So many NGOs came to support these people who were displaced. I was like, I was thinking myself, there is something that's, that went wrong, or that is wrong, that's happening. I went to the host community, uh, the ori origin communities where they, these people were living, and I had a talk. It was Madesi people who lost their house. It was hill people who burned down the Madesi people's house, but they were living in the hill, house, hill, hill people's house, and the hill people were the ones who were displaced. The case was different. The context was different. Nobody really came and understood the context. Pe donors just wanted to show the numbers, and they, wanted, they supported all these hill people who were displaced. And, and, and 
there was a create the, the UN UN want to create the shelter there and they build the temporary shelter and they want to continue this small you know IDP shelters so that they can get fundings and you know. So mostly it was reactive. The flaws in our aid, what I realized when I work with this community was like, mostly the donors are focused on threats, like, okay. And it's, they are focusing on rudimentary cost benefit analysis, just for a preliminary case, for numbers, for immediate results and hard quantifying variables. They were mostly reactive. They reacted in a situation. What situation? The conflict, the violent situations. And it's more on one dimensional analysis. No contextual analysis were done. It was, oh, people were displaced and they were in the communities. Well, they were in the jungle and these displaced people have to be supported. So it's one dimensional analysis. So mostly donors were focusing on the reactions. The actions happened and then the reactions. So yeah, mostly I, I like that statement. Uh, well, mostly stakeholder involved in conflict prevention effort lack capacities in translating and implementing sustainable conflict prevention measures, addressing the root causes of conflict. That's happening well, that, that, was hap that happened during this conflict. Mostly stakeholder involved didn't really go and find the context and didn't analyze the root causes of the conflict. So my learning when I was working with Caritas in Nepal, no, we really have to integrate conflict sensitivity, prevention, and transformation strategy to really resolve this conflict. People were longing to go back home. Conflict is there. It's a complex situation. And it's jungle, temporary shelters, unsafe, with animals, rape cases were reported. And then we, couple of people, sit together and felt, OK, let's go to the communities. And I initiated five members of team and then went to the communities. We use this model mm, along for the conflict transformations. Basically, the crisis management uh, happens very immediately right after the conflict. And, and then we prepare people with dialogues and trainings. Uh, and then we design a social, together with the community, we design a social change. And then we desire a future. Well, what kind of future we aim to? So if we, re if we reach at the vision level, we are at the desired future. That is a real integrated conflict prevention approach. We really have to build, resolve the issues, build on relationship, then, then change the subsystem, and finally change the system to, to reach a desired future. Yes. So we started a dialogue with the communities. So you see two, two different people. One belong to the Muslim communities. Not all of them are Muslims, but uh, Indian origin and the Nepali or the Hill origin. Around 12 individual separate dialogues took places between one groups. Uh, well, it was separate. 12 different uh, groups dialogue were happen happened. And then five joint community level dialogue happened. Like we, we brought them together and then we discussed how could we you know, prevent this conflict and work for sustainable peace buildings in the communities. So mostly it was bottom up approach. So we want community to lead and community be, to be more engaged and co community feel the ownership for the projects rather than we coming and implementing what, whatever we want or whatever donor wants. So community themselves, they develop a peace building activities. 
and they decide, okay, we're going to build a shelter, but we will form a team. We will have one group from this community and one group from these communities come together and build one center. That is, both the groups put their effort to build all 200 houses there. And the community said, we need a police post there for law and order. So, okay, we showed them how they can, ask, how they can raise the government to have the police post. And then they requested government to establish a police post there. And they developed a displaced return framework. It was like what to do before, what to do during, and what to do, what to be done after the return. This framework was developed by the communities. And while displaced people were coming in the communities, they were welcoming. Both the groups were sitting together. You know, in Nepal, we have uh, uh, like welcome, welcome. We welcome people by tikas. You know, we put mm, rice and red colors on the foreheads, and we hug each other and then welcome. So that that was really happening. The community were really welcoming who were displaced from the uh, the groups. You know, the hilly people. So then began the community development approach, like. We had a dialogue with them, and then we built a school for them. And then training. They asked, well, we try to implement Caritas peace building training manuals into the communities, but most of their content were rejected. And we had to work on building their own, like we, we had to contextualize the training manual instead of just bringing the Western philosophies and ideas of conflict transformation and peace building in the communities. So we did that session and we built, or we designed a local contextualized training manuals for, for developing a training packages for them, for the community members. So, well, integrated program has to really cover the holistic components of development. I'm, I'm mostly influenced by Maslow's hierarchy theories, and this is what people down there really understood about this, and I really quote this here. The basic needs people put where we need food, we need shelter, we need water, and you know, we need this. So they were mostly physiological needs, and then their safety needs were ad address, security, like police post, um, and then employment, where they, they were really very scared about farmings. They never did farmings. Uh, the project really, you know, encouraged them to do integrated pest management farming, where we started the agriculture project as well. And then they, their safety needs were met. And then love and belongingness, they were so united in the communities. Uh, they, they, they share their religious, culture, everything with both the groups. They invited them when they were having a festivals, you know, vice versa. Uh, as I was going, uh, you know, and their teams were built on. Uh, there were confidence living in the communities. The way uh, when I talked with them before and after, they said that, oh, okay, we are confident living in our communities. So well, self-actualization process, I haven't talked about them because I, I left the project area and I had to go to other areas. Basically, if we achieve all this, you'll reach into the mastering of all this. So you are, you are a master there. It's more an uh, intellect. You know, no, somebody mentioned about that uh, from World Vision. Mm, it's more spirituality, or it's, you get more spiritual, yeah. So we were proactive in doing that. However, it was late. We, we acted in the same term to prevent the conflict. If we had got a chance to act early, 35 people wouldn't have killed. There won't be any cases, violent, uh, cases of violence. But still, at the end, we were so proactive in uh, conflict prevention. So what proactive focuses on 
mostly on opportunities. We saw the opportunities to really prevent the conflict. And we did the cost-benefit analysis. It, it's so comprehensive. We understood the context. And we used like soft variables, re building trust, building relationship, and uniting communities, being in the communities, talking with them, not as a donor. We, we didn't act as a donor. Just go there, do your work, and come back. So it's more a multidimensional and cross-impact analysis. So we are so proactive in preventing that conflict. So however, OK. However, we had a challenges in, in, in implementing this conflict prevention approach. Definitely time. It takes long time to do all these kind of activities. And qualitative, basically donor wants quantitative reports, not qualitative. We want, we want report right away. In six months, what did you do? What happened? So it, peace and conflict prevention is a long-term process. It doesn't happen overnight or over month. Or, you know, it takes time. So it's, it's sensitive contextual analysis and pl planning. It's a little more where donor, there's, it's a, there's a gap between donors and being beneficiaries. So donor really don't know what's happening in the local context or local dynamics. So that's a challenge to make donor understand about if you rely on fundings. So intergovernmental dialogue and coordinations, there has to be inter intergovernmental dialogue and coordinations, which lacks uh, during conflict. So sometimes national priorities are different than you know, local communities. And funds for the integrated project, it may a challenge. You, you won't get a lot of funding, a lot of funding for this because it's a long, long term work, and donors really don't like to fund long term projects. They just like to fund one or two years projects. So thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Uh, thanks a lot, Mukti. I, I'm, um, I'm not going to try and encapsulate what you said. Most of the people in this room have heard me talk far too much over the course of the last eight months. Uh, but I noticed there are some questions. Zach. In the interest of time, I'll, uh, I'll address both the questions that one for each of you. Uh, first and foremost, thank you very much. It was a truly a privilege to listen to you guys. Um, Maria, th my, f my question to you was, um, you mentioned the new uh, masculinity initiative. Uh, and you mentioned how initially it was like five people who kind of turned out. How did you guys um, expand that exponentially to have more people, more males coming and taking part? Because that would be something really great to kind of implement in other places if that's uh, you know, a success there. And my question to you, uh, Mukti, is you mentioned that the caste system in Nepal is a hindrance on such initiatives as it is in other, many other places. And do you believe that or, or is it possible to use it as a promotion of development? Can you work within it to promote development? Or do, you ha do we have to wait to overthrow that system to be able to have sustainable development initiatives be successful? And again, thank you guys. Um, so regarding new masculinities, that's, um, it's a really good strategy. It has been implemented by plan, um, like in the, in the past several years, I would say. And in Tumaco, um, it was very difficult, as, as you mentioned. Uh, five people only assist, I mean, only five people assisted to the, only five men assisted to the, to the training, which was a huge challenge. And it's a common challenge, I have to say. So what the, what the team did um, on the field, they just started to try to implement different strategies. So I, an example would be just, um, they started uh, organizing baseball games. And then, based on baseball games, then afterwards, most of men would go to those to the to a sports activity, and then based on that, the the meeting was afterwards. So, so you're counting with some men who are going to be there, and then and then afterwards, um, there were couples sessions. So, like the wife would just like insist, or to her to her partner, or to um, her um, husband, and that's different different. Um, for example, something that changed was, um, or uh, like the team tried to change the schedule of the, just trying to accommodate to whatever men, free time that men had. 
Um, and that really helped. And then afterwards, actually, I think that once you have a litter, it is easier for that person to work within the community and start changing others, just, just like spreading the word. And I think that that's, that's what happened. And then it was a slow process, but I mean, but we, it was successful in the end. Well, thank you for the question, actually. Well, cost based it's, it's the whole different context, actually. Uh, it's the same thing, though, in Nepal. Uh, unlike Rwanda, well, the Rwandan context is changing differently because people are not claiming themselves to be Hutu or Tutsi. They are calling themselves to be Rwandese. But whereas um, in Nepal, I would rather see the caste being there as a cultural, uh, promoting cultural and heritage, but omitting or you know disfragmenting the discrimination practices that that's been there since so many years. Uh, there is policy coming up. The main problem is we don't have a constitution yet, actually. So the people are writing the constitution. So I, unless and until we have a constitution in place. Uh, we cannot really think about, you know, implementing development approach into the cost-based practices. Thank you, Mukti. I really enjoyed your uh, the story you related. I have a question about whether you've had a chance to reflect on the distinction between uh, insiders and outsiders in those situations who take on the role of working towards those root causes of conflict. All right, what's the difference between a Nepalese insider and outsider? And is there an attempt to train people at the community level to be peacemakers in that sense? Oh. I take it as an advantage. Being, being a Nepali in the communities, uh, I was easily accepted by the communities, uh, and I speak, uh, well, I speak the language, and I, I establish a connectivity with the communities so easily. But it would be very difficult for an outsider, as a foreigner, getting into the community and doing a so, you know, this kind of act, act, uh, activities. Uh, so we need a lot of trainings to build the peacemakers within local context so that they will have e easy access to the communities and work for conflict prevention rather as an outsider going in the communities and starting doing their own work. So I think as, as a foreigners, I think it will be very challenging. If I was a foreigner, it would have been a very challenges for me to get into that communities. Did that answer your question? Well, I was thinking about that. We had to we had to train them in in course of our peace activities or peace programs. Uh, we choose different leaders uh, from the groups. We train them to be a peace uh, the you know you know the contextualized peace training manuals that we develop together, and we train them how to deliver all the peace materials into the communities. And they were the one who went into the community and trained the women's and the other groups. Thank you to Maria Paula and, and Mukti. Another round of uh, applause <laughs> for both. Um, some really, two really enriching um, presentations uh, and, and challenging contexts. You know, I had running through my mind were, were all the project design questions about uh, in, um, like uh, how, do you, how do you measure success in, in, the, in, the, in the, like at the kind of ultimate outcome level. Um, in terms of in a conflict zone, right? Like, uh, is there a reduced conflict? I had all these questions running through my mind when, as we were going, but um, we, we can take the, those up as kind of side uh, a after the presentation. But I, 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 we can't leave without saying a great word of thanks to Jackie for all of her. <laughs> no, yeah, whatever. No, that's for you, yeah. No, that's for you, Keep, please keep it. I've got enough, I've got enough Humber swag. <laughs> but thanks, Jackie. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thank you, and thank you all for, thank you all for being here.